Okay, let's stand. I just had a world of thoughts in those last few songs that really don't have anything to do with my message at, at all. Um, but one one thought that I had was just, and this this is the predominant thought, so this is the one I want to share. God created man specifically to serve him. That's why we were created. We are called to glorify God and to serve him and to praise him with our whole life. And Jesus, when he came here, he told man specifically how to live so that man could glorify God and honor God and worship God. And I think sometimes it's really easy for mankind to think about Jesus only or simply the things that Jesus taught or doctrine or do I disagree with this or do I agree with this and we get into all these thoughts and all these mental controversies or whatever and we so often miss this very simple but most important thing, that we worship God and honor Him with our thoughts and our lips and our actions. Um, I know that my tendencies are not even to worship God when I pray or tell Him how great He is. So anyway, just just an encouragement towards that. I mean, um, anyway, so let us pray. Our great God in heaven, Holy is your name. Holy are all your works. You and you alone are the only God. <clears throat> and we worship you. We worship you because you are good. We worship you because you are so kind and merciful. We worship you because in all that there is, you are the only thing worthy to be worshipped. We thank you for your creating us and for your allowing us to know you, for your calling us. We worship you for your provision that you give to us, though we definitely do not deserve it. Thank you for this good rain, for this building that keep us dry, for our clothing, for making things these days quite a bit easier than the time when clothing was counted as the same thing as gold and silver. Thank you for this bountiful provision that you give to us, God. May you be honored and glorified with our lives. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come. We pray that your will would be done in our lives and in our, our thoughts and in our families and in this church and in this world, just like you would have it done in heaven. We thank you for your provision and we pray that you would continue to provide for us. God, we do ask that you would forgive us our sins in the same way that we forgive others. I ask that your spirit would quicken our hearts and minds to see if we have any bitterness inside of our souls or our minds or a root of pride and help us to, to weed that out. Lord, we pray that you would protect us from Satan and from his workers and that you would put your angels around us today and give us safety. Lord, open up our eyes and our ears that we may have ears to hear these simple and practical advice that I'm going to try to share today. Pray these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, um, well, I have for several years been thinking about the topic of marriage because we've been talking about divorce and remarriage and the permanency of marriage and the doctrine of non-reconciliation and all these things. <clears throat> and then I have, I've got, the, Margo and I have got the opportunity to to be involved with dear people and in, in counseling, marriage counseling, 
And uh, I am a definite advocate for marriage, for good marriage. It's a wonderful thing, and I'm definitely opposed to bad marriage. Um, so anyway, so I was... I, had, I, I have a desire to preach a whole bunch of series on just the simple doctrines of marriage, but I would like to just talk simply just about the very basics of marriage. Mostly, I'm thinking of young people. We have just a whole bunch of young people. Like, even these 12-year-olds in six and seven years will be big enough that they could get married. And we have a whole bunch of people who are at the age that they could get married, so on and so forth. So these are just good meditations to think about. So I don't know if I would title this Meditations on Marriage or just Basic Doctrines of Marriage. But anyway, so we're just going to talk about this. It's, it's going to be practical. It's going to be very real. And in certain places may be raw, but... So let's start at the very beginning in the book of Genesis and turn to chapter 1. And let's just see what our, creator, what our Creator did. And I've got a whole bunch of verses, and uh, so you can just get your fingers ready or just listen. Genesis 1, verses 26 and to 28. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and every, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the living things that move upon the earth. And God said that he has given man every uh, plant and tree for food, and their seeds thereof. So, right away we see that it was God who created man, and Really simply, there are so many different things we're going to talk about, so my focus really is just going to be on like the marriage thing. But we see here, God created man and woman, and he created them uh, to be married um, and to have dominion over the earth. God created man to tend his earth, to serve him, basically. It's just We were humankind, mankind was created to be God's servant. Um, we're not angels, we're humans. He also created us in his image. We are not deity, but we are created in his image. People, humans are referred to as people, or they're referred to as somebody who has personhood, and what makes something have personhood is the ability to think, the ability, which would be like choice, um, emotions, Oh, there's three parts. I'm having a brain freeze here. Emotions. Help me, Mama. Mind, will, and emotions. So we have the ability to choose. We have the ability to comprehend. And we have emotions. These are all on a creature level, not on the creator level. God is the pinnacle of the greatness. He is the ultimate person, if you will. We're created in his image. He has all those things. He can choose. He has the ability to process, and he has emotions. Okay. Now, if you flip over the page, we can see a little more specifically what happened, how, how we were created by God in chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. It says, These are the generations of the heaven and earth when they were created, in the days that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet on the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now skip down to verse 15. So right away we see that God created just man. Man uh, was created first. There was no wife at this juncture. But in verse 15 it says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Again, we see the servanthood aspect of man. Uh, it was not about man being served by God. It was about man serving God, rather. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper suitable to him, or as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs, it actually in the Hebrew says a part of his side, piece of his side, and closed up the place that he took the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called Woe Man. For she, for out of man, this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So, we see that this, this awesome creation here. God creates this wonderful world, and he creates man to serve him. For whatever purposes he has, we don't know. He doesn't say why he thought it would be a good idea. But that's the way it is. And man is working, and God, he doesn't share this with man, but he... He obviously is expressing this. Moses is expressing these thoughts that God had. Man needs a helper. Man starts naming all these things. And he sees, you know, you've all heard this. The boy lion, the girl lion, the boy giraffe, the girl giraffe. All these things. He names them. But there's no girl man. There's no, like, the equivalent of the girl side of the man. And he's all bummed. You know, but then God says, okay. Takes out of his side. Puts man to sleep. Takes out of his side. And then brings a woman to man, and he's like, at last, or finally, or this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. In the English versions, it doesn't really express this, this excitement that the Hebrew word would be like. That's why I like this translation, because it says, at last. You know, like he's done all this work, and now here's his counterpart, his companion. And God put them into the garden. Why? Because he needed a companion, but it says... A helper. He needed a helper to help him. So remember that. We'll come back to this idea later. But a helper. Something else we see is that the two become one flesh. One. You have two things. Man and woman. But when they come together, they become two I mean, the two become one. And so you have, you have a man, and he comes, he leaves his father and mother, and the, the lady leaves her mother, and the two cleave to each other. 
And they, they instead of being two, they become one. So I, w- I was actually wanting to bring milk and chocolate, and I was going to... But this does the same thing. But you see this? Now what we have is this liquid that is neither what this was before. This, was, this had been water. And this is grape juice. But when they come together, they make this new substance, which is, which is what it is. It is watered down grape juice. But it is one separate unit. It is one now. And, and if you pour some of this out, it's still, it still is what it is. It is. It's one unit. It's permanently this way. And what happens is maybe, maybe in life, eventually, one of the two die, and it's, and it's half, becomes half. But it's still just one, it's just one unit, but it can then be joined to something else and made into another unit of one. But while it is the unit of the husband and wife, it is only one. It starts out as two, and they fuse spiritually in a mystical way that we do not understand. The scripture doesn't even explain how. What we know is that from the beginning it was this way. So let's just look at Malachi really quick too. I just I want to give support for this um, that in the beginning this was God's intent. Malachi three, Malachi three, verses thirteen. Or yeah, Malachi, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Okay. Okay, so here you have these priests of Israel, if you read the context. So what I'm just going to read from 13 down, but just point out some stuff. This is a prophet speaking. And this you do as well. He's talking to the priest, the prophet is. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping, groaning, because he has, he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor at your hand. You ask, why does he not? Because the Lord was a witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did not one God make her both flesh And spirit are his. And what does the one God desire? God, godly offspring. So look to yourselves and do not let anyone be faithless to the wife of his youth. And this is God talking now. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And covering one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to yourself and do not be faithless. So, the reason I brought this up was not actually to talk about divorce, but simply the fact that this, this even goes back to the beginning. The one God created the man and the woman to be companions, and this is a covenant thing that cannot be broken. And even if you, as a human, think that you're going to separate from it, and you go and, and be joined with somebody else, you're rejected by God. And God is not accepting that. Why? Because God... In, in his realm, in eternity, sees the, the wife of the man's youth and the man as one flesh. It is, it is, it's a non-negotiable thing. It is an eternal thing that is not questionable or breaking. When a young man is joined to a young woman, they become one flesh until one or the other of them passes away. It is just the way it is. Jesus goes on to support this um, in in Matthew 19. 19. uh, We'll start in verse 3. And then we're going to go to Mark 2 also. But Matthew 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees came to him, and to test him they asked, 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Because you remember, by this time, the Mosaic Law had written up all sorts of rules and regulations for people whose heart were not wanting to follow God. Men who would separate themselves from their wives. And so they're asking Jesus this because there's no doubt that Jesus had been going around all the land teaching that marriage was permanent. And these people, no doubt, had divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried. And Jesus was calling this adultery. So they wanted to test him. And he answered, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and the two and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And so they no longer are two, but they are one. Therefore, what God has put together, let no one separate. Why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? And he said to them, it is because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wife, but from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for unchastity and marries another, commits adultery. And in Mark 10, we see the same account. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to, I just mark it in your minds. Mark 10, verses 2 through 10. Jesus goes through the same thing. Maybe it is the same account, but I'm sure it was talked about over and over. But flip over to Romans chapter 7, and let's see, is this the opinion that the apostles had? Well, at least the apostle Paul taught this. Romans 7, verse 2 and 3 says this. Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with any other man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. And then flip to 1 Corinthians 7 and to verse 39 in that. And it says this in verse 39. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if the husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes but only in the Lord. So I think there is, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, if you or anybody is just willing to be honest with the scriptures, it is very clear that Jesus did not allow divorce um, because conceptually divorce, divorce isn't even really real. It's just something that man has created to convince himself he's doing something right. But in God's eyes, a man and a wife are one flesh. Whether they leave leave each other's location or not. If somebody wants to be honest, then they can come to really no other conclusions. Okay. The second point is, here in this talk about marriage, just some basic roles of of marriage. So I'm going to go through the basic roles, husband, basic roles of a wife, and then I am going to give big warnings and some advice for you who are not married yet and who may someday... want to get married or feel led to be married. So, But basic roles of the husband and the wife. So let's start with the husband first. If you would turn to Ephesians 5, verse 23, um, we'll go there. Okay. We'll start here. We'll just go ahead and read to verse 33. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject in everything to their husbands. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her 
in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of that kind, of the kind, yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and the wife should respect her husband. Okay, so we see the main admonition here for the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. So we're doing, getting ready to do big lessons this winter and critical thinking at my house for some of my students. And one thing you have to do if you're going to be a critical thinker is you have to be able to ask questions. Who, what, when, why, where, how many, and these are like the root questions, and then you can just put whatever on to those first question words. Who did it? Who said it? Who was there? Etc. How many? How is this to be done? How much of it is supposed to be applied? Anyway, if you can think by asking questions, so let's just do that here. What was it that Christ did to love the church, or how did he love the church? And how can we do the same thing as men? Okay. The good thing is here, he gives us an example. He tells us what Christ did, right? Christ gave himself for the church. He gave everything, including his life. Okay, so we have in Philippians, and I think it's chapter 2, where it talks about what theologians would call the hypostasis, the emptying of Christ who left who left eternity and became a man. For why? For mankind. But ultimately for those who would follow him, the church. He left everything. He gave everything up, including his life, to the church so that she might be saved. His whole focus, Christ's whole focus when he was on earth, was the glory of God and the true life of the church. These were his two. Number one, he was doing this because he wanted to bring glory to God. And so, what did God want him to do? He wanted to tell all these people how he wanted, how God wanted them to live. And then gather them up, make them pure, so that someday they would be as if a holy bride. So, Men, if you want to get married, you need to, number one, make your whole focus the glory of God. Number one. So, if you want to serve God, you need to be knowing that in getting married, it is to further the glory of of God or to further the work that God would want you to do. You just don't get married willy-nilly because it feels like the right thing to do right now. You just don't do it because it's fun or you just, you just would like to. If you're following God, then it needs to be for the glory of God and for the work of God. And when that happens, then you take the wife and you pour your whole self into her, because what happens is you and her become one flesh, and then God expands that typically into a family. That is a unit that, if it's done for the glory of God, will do the work of God. 
Okay? That's why you have to give yourself to your wife like Christ gave himself to the world. He poured everything that he had. His whole, his whole focus was primarily the glory of God. This was the overarching theme of why he did everything he did. But he went and he preached. He went and he taught. He, he, he provided. He, he cleansed. He did all these things. So, husbands, if as a Christian man, your goal is to totally be a servant of Christ. If you get married, then you pour that avenue into your wife, and she becomes part of this work. And when you pour yourself into her, then that will expand into the ministry to serving God outside of this. Okay. He, number two, he provides for the church. So that was just like an overarching thing of what Christ did, but specifically, what does he do? He physically provides for the church and for everybody. If it was not for God, Hebrews says, the world would fall apart. We pray, and God provides for us food, water, clothing, shelter. Jesus tells us not to worry. If you pray in my name, you'll receive these things. He was a provider for his disciples. He provides for the church. And men, it is your responsibility if you get married, your role to be a provider for your wife. There is no question about that. If you're lazy and you don't like to work, you should maybe not get married. That's just the bottom line. If you like to whine and complain because work is... Uh, maybe you should think like, Maybe I'm not ready to get married yet. Maybe there needs to be some maturing because if you're going to get married, and I'm not talking about providing for your wife so you can be rich. Food and clothing and shelter, water, with these things we will be content. But there is labor that goes involved in getting those things. And to the extent that you provide for your family, of course that's between you and God. But just know if you're a lazy guy and you just don't want to work, then you, I mean like, number one, you should just be like, Maybe I'm not a candidate for getting married. Number three, Christ purifies the church by washing her with the word. And in the same way, a husband must teach his wife the scriptures and help her to become more and more godly. He must purify her. He must wash her. So what does that mean? Number one, single men, if you don't know the scriptures well, you better start learning them if you'd like to get married. You need to disciple. You need to, you need to, to become an approved workman of the scriptures, because you need to be able to take the scriptures and be thinking in the way that God wants His people to think, so that you can guide your wife. Because if you don't know how, how God is thinking, how are you going to be able to wash your wife, purify her, help her to become sanctified in the Word of God? And you have to do it. Um, like Christ does. And that means sometimes there's the Lord purifies us in a gentle way. Sometimes he purifies us like with a this thing. Kevin, my stepdad, his, his dad married this lady from the deep south. Her name was Anyways, I don't know. I can't remember her name. But I remember she brought all this stuff when she got married into his bathroom. I was in junior high. And I remember seeing these things that I'd never seen before. Like this, this, like, this thing that was kind of like a cylinder. But it was like edgy. And it was all porous. And, and I'm like, it looked like it was like, even like a like corn kind of. But it wasn't a corn thing. <laughs> Some weird thing. And I was like, what is this? And she was like, her name was Nellie. That was it, Nellie. And she was from the Deep South. And she had this really, really great accent. But she'd be like, that's for scrubbing your skin up. <laughs> Just like that. And I'd never seen this before. Like, yeah, you need to do that if you're going to have good skin. And sometimes when you wash, you have to really wash the dead skin off. Sometimes God does that. When you get married, men, sometimes the teaching is gentle. I mean, it's like you're doing family worship. Sometimes you have to confront your wife. Honey, I think there's a little bit of pride here. And I'm telling you, this is not easy. To confront your wife 
Um, like theoretically, it should be easy, but like I, I'm just a big wimp, maybe. Well, I know I am, but it's scary anyway. Just to go to somebody who you love, who who you see has sins, though you know you have sins. Does this make sense? Like to be like, and and that's just a requirement. It's not hard for God and Christ, but. You have to try to do the same thing. And that's why it's paramount that you know the scriptures and that you're actively working on it and that you're not just nitpicking your wife. And I'm not talking about nitpicking, but when there's a serious issue that needs to be dealt with, you need to, you need to be able to do it. And the, the earlier in a marriage that it's done, it is way easier than doing it when you've been married for 15 or 20 years. Trust me. I mean, it's really hard when a man tries to be a spiritual leader of his house 15 years in. Because it's usually not accepted. Um, and you'll, if you do this, you'll figure out different ways. I, I did all sorts of different ways. When we first got married, I was, I was just come with shaking knees to Margo with, like, like I'll wash the dishes for you. Why don't you read these scriptures? <laughs> and, you know, start washing the dishes, and she would go away, like, and be like, pride, 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 all these fish, you know, and, and she'd be a little upset, probably. And I'd wash the dishes, and I'd come, and I'd try to be so gentle. And, um, I, that was actually very gentle, probably more gentle now than I, more gentle then than I probably am now. But when you're married almost 20 years, it's things you're not so scared anyway. Um, but anyways, that's a re- requirement. You got to help help your wife in this way, which also means you better man up because it is not easy. Number four. This too, something Jesus gave the church commands to obey. Like, what I'm going to say, these things are totally not culturally acceptable. Like these things, but if we're supposed to be men like Christ, Christ gave the church clear commands, not ambiguous, not like yeah, I'd kind of like this done. I mean, he he knew what he wanted. He had a clear direction, and he put it forth. A husband needs to also be able to give clear commands in regards to how he wants his household managed. Your your wife just is not going to know if you don't share with her. And if you just share like this, like broad view, and like want to send the ball going, that's fine if you won't get upset with how she figures it out. And I know men who operate their house like that and it works fine. But it does not work fine when the man just like throws it out there, spins the ball, and then he comes home and he's like, why did you do that? You know, like, that is not fair for your wife. It just is not. Christ did not do that. He made it very clear. They weren't hard command. They weren't hard to understand commands. Here's something else. This is a problem that I definitely have had, um, just in general, with my wife and with my, my guys that work with me. Without even realizing it, I'll be like, tomorrow, especially in the first seven years of marriage, I would tell her something like, I want you to do this. Or like, I will be like, hey, you know this thing? And, uh, and maybe that's all I say. Hey, like that. Do you get that done? she would be like, what? Which of that? Like, which of that are you asking me about? That I, I'm like, you don't understand what I'm talking about? You got that done, right? Okay, like, your wife won't be able to read your mind for the first several years of your marriage. Even though, like, sometimes I think, like, I'll telegraph this thought to my wife. I'm like, you got it, right? And she'd be like, uh, but she didn't say. And I'd be like, but I meant, I meant this. It doesn't work. So, so like, it sounds really hard. Like, men, you got to be able to give your wife's commands. But this is, <laughs> it's not like that. It's way easier to be like, hey, this is what I'd like done today. Okay, and if, if she tries to do it, then that's great. If she's like, I'm not going to do that. Well, then there, you go back to point number three. And wash your wife with the word. Okay. Um, okay. Number five. And oh, why why would why would you need commands? Because God created a woman to be a, a helpmeet, a servant. It's okay to admit this. Like, hello, this is our culture's idea of marriage. Like, here's the woman in the castle looking out. Where is that man? 
on a white steed in shining armor who's going to come and sweep me off of my feet and take me and do all of my, all of my beckoning and whatever I tell. That is not the idea of Christianity. But that is why so many marriages in this country are so messed up. Because the wife thinks that oftentimes that marriage is about the husband meeting her needs and being this knight in shining armor when if it was going to be a comparison, it would almost be like vice versa. The man would be looking out for the woman on the white steed who is strong and willing to give it all she's got to help her husband. And he's like, oh, there she is. Like, that's the one. I want that to be my help me. I mean, if we're going to... Like that's a little more like the reality. God created a helpmeet for the husband because he needed a helper. And you also have to remember this, guys. If you get married, it's because you need a helper. There will be things that you just won't be able to get done without that help. Number five, Christ was a leader. He had a vision and a goal, and he led to meet these goals. He knew what he wanted. He knew how he was going to get there, and he did it. If you are wanting to get married someday, I mean, I'm talking to a bunch of people who hopefully are following Christ the King, or are, are going to follow Christ. That is our prayer. And if that's, the, if that's where you're at, then you need to understand what the kingdom of God is. You need to understand the vision of the kingdom of God. And you need to set the vision and the goal of your family to meet that goal. And those are going to be different in the different stages of life that you are. When you are a young married man, the goals and the vision that you have are much different than when you are 40 years old and you have 18, 19, 20-year-old children. Because there's a lot more things that you're able to do now. The goals and the visions of a young man should be, I want to wash my wife with the word. I want her to know, whatever. I love her, I'm here for her, we're going to grow together. And he, but you've got to lead. You just don't come home and be like, sit on the couch and not really like, do nothing. Oh, yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, you need to be a leader. For the kingdom of God's sake. Husbands must leave. They must get a vision. The kingdom of God. And they need to lead in order to get their family there. Number six. Christ suffered for the church to the point of death. If you are not willing to suffer pain. And depra um, deprivation. And agony. And... Um, tears and be able to still get up and go, then probably you're not ready to be married. Because you have to work. And just because you're tired when you get home from work does not mean that that's the end of the day for you. You work hard. You come home. You love your wife. You, you see what needs to be done there. You take care of the children if that needs to be done. Because you need to remember, what, right? You... Even though you're one, you're the head of the home. You're the one who you have to answer to God. God gave you a help meet. It's like, like when Abraham, you see all these patriarchs in the Old Testament, and they marry, and those, those ladies became known by their husband, like Abraham and Sarah. It was Abraham. Sarah was Abraham's wife. She was like Abraham. Like, it's like Abraham, but that means Abraham and Sarah. And you have, you have all these men, and it's like those men, that's who they are, and their wives are their helpers. They're part of them. It was Abraham's son. It was Isaac's son. It was Jacob's sons. It was Isaac's tent. It was Jacob's tent. It was their dishes. They're responsible to God because it's their family. And what, I'm, what I don't want you to misunderstand is that I'm saying, like, it's all about you. What I'm saying is, like, it's all on you. You come home, your wife has a baby, you've worked all day, she was up all night, the dishes are done, the kids got messy diapers, your wife is sick because she's pregnant again, and, and she's sick besides that, 
it, it, those are your dishes. You better wash them. This is your dirty floor. Nobody's in the church. Nobody can come help today. You better clean it. I'm like, it's, you, are you getting the idea like, you got to be the man. Like, this idea like, oh, she's sick again. again. The dishes are piling up. Well, go wash the dishes. Stay up all night if you have to. Be a man. This is what it is to be a man. This is what it is to be a husband. Um, so, husbands too will suffer uh, to purify, to take care of, to take care of a sick child, to take care of a sick wife. Um, because, you know, it's the lot of some people that when they get married, then their wife gets sick and they suffer. And they suffer in bed. Are you man enough to marry somebody and get into a car accident and your wife be totally deformed and still love her? Because this is what it is to be a man. Like These are things you men need to think about if you really want to get married because it is nice and it's fun and it is so special and I don't want to take away from that special time before and right after you get married. But <clears throat> six months in, your wife gets in a car accident and she gets all burned up like, and she looks like a piece of leather. You still got to love her. And you even need to like her. There's a difference between love and like. Love is doing what is the best for somebody. Liking is like, like, I really like my wife. I love her too, but I really like her. I like to be with her. I like to be around her. She's so good to me. This makes me want to be good to her. But I like her. And you can, you can work the situation as a man to make those kinds of situations more palatable, more possible, even if you have a bad wife. Because you're probably listening to all these things thinking like, I'm going to have a good wife. But guess what? All these things you still have to do even if you have a bad wife. What if she's rebellious? What if she always argues with you? What if she does this and this and this and this? I mean, like, these are all real things. You just don't do these six things when you have a good wife. Okay? Okay. Let's switch things around here. The role of a wife. Uh, let's, let's look back here in Ephesians 2, 22, 522. Wives, be subject to your husbands as... It, if they are the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. Um, verse 24. So also wives ought to be in everything subject to their husbands. So we see that a wife's role is to submit to her husband. But are there specific roles given in the Bible to show like what kind of things a wife would do? Well, there are. The overarching role of a wife is to be the helpmeet of her husband. She's supposed to serve, submit to him, and so on and so forth. So girls, if you like to be the boss and be in charge, it would be best for you not to get married yet. Because if you go and you think you're going to boss and run the marriage, then you're going to be in sin. That's just the way it is. So let's turn to 1 Timothy first. Because we see, we see some stuff. We can learn some stuff about these, these sisters who are widows here. Here's the instruction to widows, but why is this important? Because it tells us what they've done. Okay, verse 3. Honor widows who are really widows. If a widow has children and grandchildren. Um, the real widow left alone and has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers day and night. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead. Give these commands as well, so that they may be above reproach. And whoever does not prove, provide for his relatives and especially his family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Verse 9, let a widow be put on the list if she is less than, no less than 60 years old and has married only once. Now, I want us to notice this, starting in verse 10. What, what are these widows? These are like the godliest women in the church, okay? 
So what is it that they did that put them at this stature? You young ladies should be listening to this like, I want to be like this. This should be like, ding, 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 in your head right now. Okay. She must be well attested for her good works as one who has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, devoted herself to doing good in every way. Okay. So, so like these widows are characterized by good works. This is something I want you to recognize. Like these ladies are recognized for their continuous labor, laboring with their husband, laboring with their children, working in the church, serving the saints, meeting these needs, attested at doing good works. One thing that it does not say that these women were is that they spent all their time studying the scriptures and being able to recite the scriptures and seeming very spiritual. The reason I bring this up is because in modern day America, women are lauded who can do all that. They can say scripture, they can, they can talk big, they can have what they think is a real spiritual prayer life, but they're not known for these things. And if they're not known for these things, that is fake. And in all these other lists, I'm going to read several lists of examples of what godly women are. That is not on one of them. Not one. Not even one time. In fact, this is the closest thing to that. Like these widows, they serve so much that, that the church is like, have these women pray now. They are godly women. They have proven to be godly women. Why? Because of their good works. Look at all they've done. It wasn't listen to how they talked. It was look at what they have done with their life. So, before you young ladies who would like to get married, he goes on and says this. Now this is two young widows, but he says this. But refuse to put a young widow on the list. For when she has sensual desires... Um, her sensual desires alienate them from Christ, and they want to marry. And so, because they, they had made promises to not. And besides, these young ladies end up being idle. Okay, so we're going to get a list of negative things. These things should be like checked in your mind. I should not be like this. They, these women should, should not be idle, gagging about from house to house, they are merely idle and also gossips and busybodies. So they talk a talk a lot and they're busybodies saying what they should not say. Okay. These are things that you all need to pay attention to. You should not be a young lady who goes from house to house being lazy, just wanting to talk, 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 talk. Did you hear about this? Did you see that? What do you think about these things? No, you should be characterized by being so busy, you don't have time to do these things. This is the compare and contrast here. So this is what the apostle says. So I would have younger widows marry. Okay, so here's a role of a young, young mother. Bear children, manage their home, so as to give the adversary no occasion to revile us. For some have already turned away to following Satan. If any believing woman has relatives, okay, then he goes on to talk about that. Okay, so we see here in the Timothy passage, young sisters are to marry. When they've married, they're supposed to bear children and manage their home. Now let's look at Titus here. Titus chapter 2, we see some things here, too, that are very important for young sisters to consider, but also the older women... These things overlap to all of us. So I'm, my message is to young people, but it definitely should be heard by all of us. There's always room for improvement in marriage. There's always room for self-examination. And we need to be the best husbands, and we need to be the best wives that we can possibly be. Because that only brings glory to God. Because it's what God intended us to do. Verse 3, it says this. Likewise, tell the older women to be reverent. Okay, so young 
young ladies, young sisters, and young, young girls who are not sisters yet, but hopefully will, these things are things that you should think, like, when I was a young man, I looked at, I looked at the list of what it would be to be an elder, and they were like these, these things that were so, like, seemingly unattainable. But I strove to do it, and, and I was, my spirit was very aware when I did not meet those things. This is the same kind of thing. As we go through these things, your ears and your heart should perk up. Even though this is like, this is going to explain how the godly older women are already, and then what they should do. And then it's going to teach them that they should teach these things to the younger women. So you should hear, this is how the older women are, and these are the things that I need to learn. So just take it like this. Tell the older women to be reverent in their behavior, not to be slanderers or slaves to drink. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the younger women to love their husbands. And by the way, I just want to blow this myth out. This is where I came from. There was the myth. The Bible never says that wives are supposed to love their husbands. They're just supposed to respect them. That is a lie. It's right here. It says wives are supposed to love their husbands. Because, because it, it's always like, like this, like, where I came from, there's this victim mentality. Oh, I get the short end of the stick all the time, you know. But all I'm required to do is respect him. But he's got to love me. He's got to bring me candy and flowers and all this stuff. Like, that is not what the word means, love. That would be like, and that would be fine if he wanted to bring you candy. But if you're not likable, then don't feel bad if he doesn't bring you candy. Like, become likable. But, I mean, that's just a side note here. But husbands are supposed to love their wives, take care of them as a weaker vessel. Wives are to respect and submit to their husbands and love them also. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, to be chaste, to be good managers of the home. This phrase rises up over and over and over and over again. A good manager of the home. Kind. Being submissive to their husbands. So why? So that the word of God may not be discredited. And you young men, listen to this. You are to be sober or self-controlled. Okay, so in Titus we see, number one, a reverent behavior, not slanderers, not slave to drink. They need to learn to teach what is good. They need to be able to teach younger wives. Younger wives need to love their husbands, love their children, to be self-controlled, to be chaste, pure, good managers of the household, submitting to their husbands. How do you young girls that are not married respond to your fathers? You talk back all the time? Are you obedient? Are you obedient with a bad attitude? Or are you obedient with an attitude that says, I seek to do my dad's will? Okay? Are you just doing what is absolutely required in your housework? Or are you thinking, I want to learn to be a wife? Like, okay, so I know how to cook this. Maybe my mom and my dad would give me permission to try to do something else. Because what could I imagine that a husband might need? Well, you need to have a whole toolbox ready before you get married. You may not need all those tools in your, in your pre-preparation to being a good wife, but if you have them at, at your availability, then you'll be a good wife. Um, are you self-controlled? Do you have the ability to hold your tongue? Do you have the ability to just lay something down? Do you like children? Do you, you think you could love children? you think you could love a lot of them? Do you have a problem talking? Talking too much? 
Do you talk when you talk about people or do you talk about stuff? Things to think about. Okay, some words of warning, as if there hasn't been any already, but there is more. Because, listen, I talk to a man, and I am serious. You who are not married do not know how bad a bad marriage can be. It is so bad that people kill themselves. Like, like this is deathly serious. This decision binds you to another person until you or they die. And if you just get married because you think, oh, he's so cute or she's so fun. or I'm like, I'm hoping that all of your fathers and the church will be involved to be able to help you. But in the case that that's not, listen, we are easily deceived. I mean, where we came from at these Bible colleges, like, I know this guy who was like, the day after we got married, the woman that I woke up to was not the woman who was there the day before because she had deceived him. And he had deceived himself because he was not clear-minded enough to realize how serious this was. And he was all giddy and excited about the idea of getting married that he just went and got married without really thinking, how does she act? How does she carry herself? She is awfully loud. She does talk a lot. How am I? Ooh, I don't have this sin issue taken care of. I don't have this sin issue taken care of. I don't. Like, man and woman can deceive themselves so bad. And also beyond that, you have to really be shrewd. Because, listen, girls, if you're virtuous, you especially need to trust your papas. Because... All these men are going to be like, I want to find the most virtuous woman, but there are a lot of sneaky snakes out there that can come into a circle and be like, be as pious and holy, and they, they're really smart, and they can just rattle off the scriptures, and they maybe even know history or whatever. And they may sweep in and be like, this is, this is a good guy. I mean, this is a good guy. But you've got to trust your dad, because there's a lot of men who act a certain way just so they can snag the best gal knowing that she's a good good woman, and then end up having a lot of hardship. And the same can happen too. You're a good, faithful young man, diligent. You know, watch out for those girls who start batting their eyes at you, like mm, trying to make you notice them, because girls can also deceive and try to make you think that they're something that they're not. This is why it's so vital if you have the ability let your father and your mother be involved and let it be a serious thing. And don't let it be an emotional, exciting thing because this is the next part of life. We should get married. That you're asking for trouble. You can redeem. If you get married and you end up with a bad relationship, it can be healed. But I mean, it would be much better. My advice would be it would be much better to just take it nice and easy, be clear-minded, be serious about this thing because... Once you're in, you become one. And that's not changing. And uh, anyway, so. Okay, so you know what Proverbs says. Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman or a man who fears the Lord is to be praised. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this, but if you would take notes or listen to this later, you young men and young ladies should read Proverbs chapter 5 and Proverbs 7 because it's, you see this example of a young man who was easily wooed and you see a, a bad woman, but you see her characteristics. How is she acting? She's, she's loud. She's boisterous. She, she, she wants people to notice her. Um, so you have in this, in this illustration a senseless man because he's wooed by his eyes and he's living by his emotions. Do not 
be a senseless young man. Know that Satan wants your soul, and that one of the easiest ways for Satan to get the souls of a young man is by having him get into a bad relationship. Okay, sisters, seek a man that is firmly planted on the path of wisdom. My suggestion to sisters would be, read the Proverbs, and read the book of Sirach, sisters, and notice all of the characteristics, and this to you fathers of daughters, Notice all the characteristics of the people who are not considered wise. Foolish, lazy, careless, proud, boastful, arrogant, a person who speaks carelessly. And keep your eyes open for these characteristics in young men. Even if they can speak good. And okay, so here's a little bit of there's like a little bit of a of a like a side note here. All young men have to mature too. Okay, so like don't put this, the bar so high that no man can jump over it. I'm just saying like, we got to be wise about this thing. Girls, I'm mean, just like, I have heard stories about boys in plain churches, and I think this happens way more than I would have thought, but writing notes and being like, hey, go take this to so-and-so. Yeah, hey. Let's start writing letters secretly, and our parents don't know, like, bad idea. Like, that, ladies, if you get a note from some guy, like a subtle note, like, you'd be like, maybe he even is a good guy, and he just doesn't know where to come from. But in a lot of instances, it's just like, he's trying to get around your dad, and he's trying to get right at your heart, and you need to protect your heart, and your heart needs to be in your father's place where he can take care of it, and any man who wants to come and ask for your hand really should, uh, if, he's a, if he's a manly man, he should be man enough to just go and talk to the Father. And just even just for permission to, to get to know. Maybe, maybe he just wants to get to know her. But anyway, it is a very, very, very hard thing being married to a man who has these very bad traits. Because you have to submit to him. And if you marry a bad, you marry a bad man, like I tell my daughters all the time, like, I am going to do my very, very best to make sure I can feel these men who may come and ask for their hand. And I'm going to be as, try to be as sharp and like, okay, and try to feel their hand. But the truth is that I'm easily deceived too. So I have a backup plan. You may marry a jerk. Okay, so get ready for it. If he's bad, you love him. If he's mean, you just win him without a word. Be quiet. Let your chaste behavior be such an example that he has no choice but to be like, whoa. Okay, so, so you need to know that, girls. Even if your papas do their very best to protect you, you could still end up marrying a bad guy. And you have to submit, and you need to love, and you need to lift him up and honor him, and he needs to be lauded as a great man in your children's eyes and all these things. Okay, so to the men now, uh, take a warning. Does she submit gladly to her father? Does she desire to be noticed for being beautiful? Because if she does, there's some vanity in there. I would really encourage you guys to really not be looking after the ones there is so much more than beauty. I mean, and really, it's an interesting thing about, like, first perception beauty and what happens after you get to know somebody. And when you meet somebody who is a godly woman and they desire to serve the Lord, like, they are beautiful. It's just, it's like, they, whereas, like, in the flesh you may look and be like, oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like, whoa. <laughs> that's a bad that's a bad path to be on because what you're looking at is not the right thing. You need to be looking like at these things. Does she gladly do her father's will? Does she take care of children? Does she look like she's fussy when the mama says like, hey, can you take care of that? And she's here, I have to take care of my mom's child again. Okay, like, mm, maybe she's not ready. Maybe she'll be a great wife someday, but maybe not this year. Okay? I mean, these things. Is she loud? 
is she a talker who talks, 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 talks. And I'm not saying, like, it's okay to, for girls to talk. And I even appreciate my wife talks a lot. She talks way more now than when we first got married, which I like. I had to, like, prime her to get her to talk. But I know some ladies who it seems like they cannot stop talking. I don't know anybody here that has this. So don't think I'm talking about anybody here. But I even asked a man, well, did you ask her to stop talking? And he said, yes. I said, well, what did she do? And he said, she kept talking. Like, like I'm, I'm just, I'm being serious. These are things that you need, because it won't stop. Um, does she like to argue? You girls like to argue? If you do, you really need to change that. Okay, so here are some warning verses. Young men, if you mark in your Bibles, these would be some that you would want to mark. Uh, Proverbs 19, verses 13. It says this. A stupid child is a ruin to a father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. It's bad. Proverbs 21, verse 9. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in the house shared with a contentious wife. It's just true. It's just so unbearable. But if you are a follower of Jesus, man, and you marry a contentious wife, you can't live on the corner of the roof. You have to stick it out and go inside and live with her. And try to lead and do all the things that a godly man does. So check it out before you get married. Twenty-seven, verse, Chapter 27, verse 15 says this. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a contentious wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil. And the right hand. Oh, man. It is so hard. Now turn over to Sirach. Continue to get some more wisdom. Sirach chapter 9, verse 2 through 9. I appreciate everybody bearing with me. I know this is a little long, but this is so deathly important. I don't really care that it's taking this long. I just want everyone to hear this is one of the most important warnings you will ever get as a young person. I mean, and you should probably get a copy of this and then write these scriptures down and really meditate on these things because I cannot express to you the pain that I have seen in people who have not taken the time to do these things. Okay. He's a warning, young men. Do not give yourself to a woman and let her trample down your strength. Do not go near a loose woman. Do not go near a loose woman, or you will fall into her snares. Do not dally with a singing girl, or you will be caught by her tricks. And do not look intently at a virgin, at a virgin, or you may stumble and incur penalties of her. Do not give yourself to prostitutes or you may lose your inheritance. Do not look around in the streets or wander about in a deserted section. And by the way, this is like, I remember when I was a boy, I would get on my bicycle in junior high, and I don't even know why. I do know now. I didn't know then, but I would just ride around hoping to see that one little girl, that girl in my class. If she could just see me on the bike, I'm so embarrassed about this, but this is it. This is like this. Okay? Men do this. They take walks. Rob, this is why people walk in the mall. Because they want to see stuff that they shouldn't be seeing. And I'm, I'm bringing this to this point. Watch out for your phones. Last night, I had to, I had to delete this, um, this app that's called New Republic. It has pretty good news on it, but every time I would go to open it up, it would have this one section, like the first thing that pops up is all these bad things. I'm like, your phone 
is just like this. You don't even have to go around now so anybody can identify you as that boy walking around so you can see things that you shouldn't. All you got to do is pull your phone out. Which is way worse and dangerous. Because at least, at least when you didn't have a phone, at least you had to go outside and you opened yourself up to being caught. So just be careful with your phones again. Do not look around the street of the city and wander about in its deserted places. Turn away your eye from the shapely woman and do not gaze at her beauty, the beauty belonging to another. Many have been seduced by a woman's beauty and by it passion is kindled like a fire. Never dine with another man's wife or revel with her at wine or your heart may be turned aside to her and in blood you may be plunged into destruction. Now flip over to Sirach 25. Don't worry, this heaviness will get better because we're going to look at what it is to be married to a good wife. And this is not just so people don't be like, oh man, he's ragging on women so much. No, I'm like, it takes two to tango. Like, if a man didn't marry a bad wife, it wouldn't be this way. And if a wife didn't act this way, it wouldn't be that way for him. So, I mean, like, it takes two to tango. I used to say this, like, Boy, when I was a youth pastor at Blue Ridge Bible Church, it dawned on me. Like, the reason these girls started dressing so immodestly is because these supposed godly boys liked seeing it. If they would have been like, this is an abomination. You call yourself Christian girls and you're dressing like that? If the boys would have done that, the girls would have been like, whoa, um, well, uh, uh, I mean, obviously their heart's not right. Okay, but the positive peer pressure does a lot to turn things towards the way of righteousness. But I mean, the men have brought this on in our society. Um, That's all I'm trying to say. Sirach 25, 15 through 21. This, like I read these things, and this is just so sobering. There is no venom worse than a snake's venom and no anger worse than a woman's wrath. I would rather live with a lion and a dragon than with than live with an evil woman. I mean, and just so you know, like the word evil in in the Hebrew, this this word is like bad actions, like a lot of times it says the Lord brings evil in the Old King James. That word has been translated into like calamitous events, bad actions, things like this. It's not like just somebody who characterizes himself as wicked. These are bad deeds. A woman's wickedness changes her appearance and darkens her face like that of a bear. <clears throat> Her husband sits among the neighbors and cannot help sighing bitterly. Like I talked to a guy. It was so bad, he was ready to kill himself. And he did not just say that. Like it was close. Now, he was in total sin too. I don't but it's bad. A bad marriage is just like this. Any iniquity is small compared to a woman's iniquity. May a sinner's lot befall her. That's that's kind of like a tinge of the old the old covenant attitude, like punish. That's not. I don't like that. A sandy ascent for the feet of the elderly. Have you ever seen an 85 year old walk up the sand dunes in Colorado? These huge mountains of sand. They don't have any stability. Have you ever seen an old person do that? No, because it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible for a man with the strength of Dwayne to do it. It's really, really, really hard. Because you go up, you sink in, you go up. Such is a garrulous wife to a quiet man. It's just 
can't hardly deal with it. Garrulous. This is like, what's that? Yeah, talkative, talkative, talkative to a quiet man. Um, this was to go to do not be ensnared by a woman's beauty and do not desire a woman for her possessions. 23, dejected mind, gloomy face, and wounded heart come from an evil wife. Drooping hands and weak knees come from the wife who does not make her husband happy. So, these are all like just truths. So the Christian man, though, should not respond this way. Okay? I'm not, I'm not making an excuse that, yeah, okay, guys, you, you married a bad wife. No, I mean, you need to be like Christ Jesus, who was a real man and who, who endured hardships and was good. But, wives, you've got to understand, this is, what, this, is what it, this is what it does. Like It just does. This is, not, this is just wisdom. Um, and then 20, 26, chapter 26, verses 7 through 11, it says this. A bad wife is a chafing yoke. Taking hold of her is like grasping a scorpion. A drunk wife arouses great anger, and she cannot hide her shame. A haughty, or a prideful, a haughty stare betrays an unchaste wife. Her eyelids give her away. Keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter, or else when she finds liberty, she will make use of it. Be on guard against her impudent eye, and do not be surprised if she sins against you. That's very serious. But hey, there's some really good news. Because if you're married and you're a godly man, and you're a godly wife, there is such a wonderful thing here. Such a wonderful thing. And if there is a marriage that has been bad, or is currently bad, or whatever, I'm just thinking of this dear friend of mine, it can be good. But for all of you, just start out on a good foot. It makes it way easier. But if you look back at chapter 26 here in verse 1, it says this, Happy is the husband of a good wife. The number of his days will be doubled. I've said this before, I'll say it again. The wife has like some of the greatest power in the whole world. A woman has a power to destroy her husband and her children. If she does not submit to her husband and, and does not encourage him and serve him, she will destroy him, and she will destroy her children. But likewise, she can double the days of his life. A loyal wife brings joy to her husband, and he will complete his years in peace. <laughs> this is so exciting to me, because I think of all of these young people. And a good marriage is totally attainable takes two people who are humble and they do what they're supposed to do. A good wife is a great blessing. Like, if that is not the understatement of the day. A gr good wife is a great blessing. She will be granted among the blessings of the men who fear the Lord. So men, if you fear the Lord, God may grant you a good wife. So that's where I would start with you young men. Now if you go over to verse 13 through 16, he keeps talking about a good wife. A wife's charm delights her husband, and her skills put flesh on his bones. She's good at home keeping. A silent wife is a gift from the Lord, and nothing is so precious as her self-discipline. And I don't think that this, when he says silence, means she doesn't speak. It means that she's not nagging him and bossing him around and being loud and garrulous. A modest wife adds charm to charm and no scale can weigh the value of her chastity. Like the sun rising in the heights of the Lord, so is the beauty of a good wife. 
in her well-ordered home. And skip down to verse 19. My child, keep sound the, the bosom of your youth and do not give your strength to strangers. Seek a fertile field within the whole plain and sow it with your own seed, trusting in your own stock. So your offspring will prosper and have and having confidence in their good descendants, they will grow great. A prostitute is regarded as spittle, and a married woman is a tower of death to her lover. A godless wife is given as a portion to a lawless man, but a pious wife is given to a man who fears the Lord. A shameless woman constantly acts disgraceful, but a modest daughter will even be embarrassed before her husband. A headstrong wife is regarded as a dog, but one who has a sense of shame will fear the Lord. A wife honoring her husband will seem wise to all, and if she dishonors him in her pride, she will be known to all as ungodly. The unfortunate thing is that that verse in our culture has been totally buried. And now women can, can totally dishonor their husbands and it's not even thought of as anything. Happy is the husband of a good wife for the number of his years are doubled. A loud-voiced and garrulous wife is like a trumpet sounding the charge and every person like this lives in the anarchy of war. Like, if you are ever on a battlefield, or if you know, if you've read anything about it, they get all these horses, and they get all these men, and everybody's like, and these are guys that are going to go hand-to-hand, sword combat, and their, their commanders go, and they give them these speeches, and then they start pounding their shields, and they all start getting excited, and oh, 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 and it's loud, and it's loud, and it's loud, and then all of a sudden they go, run, oh! And it's just like, and all you know, it's just, and then they, they run, and then they crash. And for the next hours, they're slicing and dicing and trying to kill each other. That's crazy. That's the anarchy of war. And that is what it's like to live with a loud voice and a garrulous wife. That's what I was meaning earlier when I said, talk, 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 talk. This, this is the example. So. Um, there is there's some other passages here. Proverbs 12.4, Proverbs 18.22, Proverbs 19.14. Talk about these great wives and how much of a blessing it is to be married to a great wife. In Psalm 128, you see this picture of a godly man and a godly wife, and they have godly children, and you see this whole thing is this picture of a godly family. Psalm 128. And then, of course, the great... Chapter to encourage young ladies is Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. And you can do all those on your own time, young people. Proverbs 12, 14. Proverbs 18, 22. Proverbs 19, 14. Psalms 28, verses 1 through 6. And Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. And I, listen, I just want you guys to know, like, I am in my, my heart here because I just think that God created marriage. It is so really important that even you young children, you young girls think, okay, if you become a virtuous woman, you have two paths. You'll, you'll, you'll either be a servant to the church and serve God in the church, or or you'll be a servant to your husband. But as a, as a young girl whose desire is to grow up and be a godly person, your path is servanthood. It's, it's to serve. It's to help. And all these things that we talked about today, whether you get married or not, are so valuable to make them who you are. You will be valued... Above all, history records these sisters who were great. Dorcas 
and other people who served. And then you have these other wives who just served quietly and humbly. And they were put on the list so that they could pray for the work of God's kingdom once their husbands passed away. Husbands, be, or future husbands, be seeking these characteristics right now. Seek to be a godly man. Seek to be above reproach. Seek to learn and get wisdom and grow. And protect your heart and your eyes and your ears from all the bad things that you can see. Do your best to not be deceived. Let's pray. God in heaven, I just thank you so much for your truth. I thank you for the institute of marriage. It is so wonderful, but it can be so bad and painful too. And I just pray that these young people here who listen to this would be so serious about this. And that their fathers and mothers would be diligent to train them. And that us who are married would be diligent to follow your ways. To be godly men. To be men who will lead and guide and be tender and gentle and compassionate. But still driven to follow your kingdom and to guide. Help our wives to be submissive. Strengthening us and helpers where we need Give them the strength to do the stuff that they need to do with the children in the house. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come, that it would spread, and you would be honored and glorified today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I just don't know that I have that much to say, but just that I say amen and appreciate <clears throat> appreciate the warnings, the encouragement, just the blessings, and um, um, I was thinking about just just pondering that verse about how a man with a good wife, how his days will be doubled, how that really applies, you know, I don't, don't necessarily think someone that would have lived to 70 with a bad wife would live to 140 with, with a good wife, but somehow I, somehow there's so much more life there, there's so much more, there's so much more there that Maybe there's just doubled the amount of of life and the abundance and fullness of it. And I <clears throat> I'm thankful for that. Um, it does seem like I was gonna one thing I thought one thing it just that's interesting. One thing that is just so true, as Brother Steve pointed out, is that beauty Beauty is uh, that that kind of beauty that he described at first glance is pretty well skin deep. And that's about it. But there's this there's like this thing that you see in women in in a virtuous woman, though she might have a a crooked nose and pale eyes or or whatever. That's just after you after you know, after you know the virtues of her, you just you just think that's a that's a beautiful woman. Uh, it's interesting that when Jacob, and I don't, I mean, somehow having more than one wife doesn't even, it's hard to understand that for me at all, but, but Jacob wanted to marry Rachel because she was beautiful. And he was disappointed when he was given Leah, which was, which was way more, oh, I don't know what the word is it uses, but pale-faced or, or not as beautiful. But at the end of his life, th these women, I think maybe both of them, gave him some trouble. Um, but I know that Rachel did because she was barren for a long time and accused him and all that. But at the end of his life, Jacob chose to be buried with Leah. 
rather than Rachel. I think his many years of marriage, uh, his many years of living with these two women, their the beauty on their face or skin just didn't didn't have too much to speak anymore. I think that's maybe all I'll have to comment on, but just appreciate it. Yeah, I too appreciated the message and everything that was shared. And I was going to comment too on what Dwayne commented on, but that's the reason for you young men to not look at outward beauty, but look for the, the thing that is inward, that it can change, yeah, but the outward is definitely going to change. The inward can change, but nevertheless, as Steve pointed out more than once or through the scriptures, it's, it's the beauty that's inward that needs to be looked for if uh, one wants to have a peaceful existence after marriage. But anyway, I, I had to think of this other thing too. There's, you know, there's something there's something more beautiful than uh, two young people that are loving each other. Someone want to make a guess? <laughs> yeah, two old people that are still loving each other or, or maybe have learned to love each other now. I don't know. I just, it, it, it always reminds me of this like when I was still single, a uh, single young man, and I remember uh, one evening, I think it was evening or Sunday afternoon maybe or some sometime, while I was living with my co-teacher, uh, at least through the week, we'd, we'd be living together in this house, shop, whatever. But anyway, remember, I think it was a Sunday afternoon or maybe it was an evening, but an older couple, they were probably getting pretty close to their 80s. Anyway, they, they went on a walk together. And we were just, I happened to see them go walking up the road and just dawned on me like, isn't that more beautiful than two young people, you know, loving each other? I mean, two old people that still abiding with each other in peace and harmony and wanting to go on a walk together, not arguing as they went, but just peacefully taking a stroll, going a little bit slower. But anyway, so just wanted to share that. I had a friend. Come on, Harvey. Can you hear? I had a friend that used to share stories about his family and one of them he told about his granddad and his grandfather would maybe her name was Jean and he was Joe, I don't know, and he would he'd look at her and just intently be like I love you, Jean and she'd be like, I know, Joe. You know what I mean? Like she was just not even interested in hearing that from him anymore and I told that story again to this this these two people that I grew up with that got married. And they looked at each other and they're like, yeah, that'll be us when we're old. Like, they were just quite content to say that. But these demeanors, you know, like, they show whenever people are young, like, they're not just there. They don't just appear later. I think these things, you know, like, you can see it in a person if they are cold-hearted or... not really, you know, just warm to people in general. 
or how they treat their parents or mother or father or anything like that. Another thought, I mean, I remember my dad had this friend that showed up, moved away to Oregon when I was like 15 from Pennsylvania, and he showed back up. Now he's on the back porch with my dad talking to him. And the woman that he married, she changed all the locks on their house and kicked him out. I mean, it was his house. I don't don't know what the circumstances are, you know. As one person said, you know, I told the story. She was like, he must have done something. But, I mean, this guy was just like, he was destroyed. Like, he was just ruined. These kinds of moments when I was in my early 20s, really stuck with me, like, I don't want that. Like, I do not want to marry the kind of person that's just going to, like, put me away. And largely, I just saw these characteristics all throughout urban society and women that work in the workplace and become managers and all of these things, that they largely lose their masculinity, like, or even sacrifice their masculinity. They'll cut their hair away. Sorry, apologize. Yeah, they become more masculine. They they lose their femininity, and the the older they get, the the more they actually begin to look like men. The way that they behave and act and carry themselves, with all these dominant ways, and <laughs> thus I did not <laughs> get married from to a woman where I grew up. It was a real blessing, and I want to say amen to it. Uh, much encouragement to consider and do. And uh, I didn't have much to say, but I just thought of uh, how Paul said, I speak concerning Christ in the church. Or this is a great mystery, I speak Christ in the church. And uh, and I also had to I just connected that together that the difference of our response to God if we obey Him if we do the things He asks of us then we have like this blessed marriage or this blessed eternity and how bad it will be if if we miss having a good marriage and we end up in eternal damnation. Anyways, it's just a thought I had that it is a great mystery.